I'm going to say thank you to the organisers too. Um, it's very humbling to be a social worker and be invited to speak to these medical conferences and I don't take it for granted, so thank you. We're going to talk about something that's very dear to my heart and that's parental grief. And lots of people have said, oh, it's a bit awful that you're finishing the conference talking about parents being upset and children dying. And yes, it is kind of terrible that we are doing that last, but... <laughs> The reality is, is that I'm not going to talk just about children who die because parents grieve about a lot of things. And I think one of the big problems is, is that in this day and age, we have been sold a terrible myth. So when my grandmother, who was a Maltese um, migrant to Australia, came here and got married, she never expected to ha be happy and she was never disappointed. Um, <laughs> She had eight children and a very hard life, and she was actually a very hard woman, but um, she was never sold this myth that marriage and having children was going to be this wonderful, joyous experience. You just had to get it right. And that is the myth that we're being sold. And so um, I often say, and there's a book called Buddhism for Mothers, which is a bit of a crock, to be honest, but anyway, there's a, there's a lovely line in it that says... Um, Parenting is everything in extremes. And for any of you who have been a parent, you will have never loved and cherished something so profoundly, and you'll have never wanted to strangle somebody so profoundly as when you're a parent. And that can literally change within seconds, can't it? And the problem is, is that we have been sold this myth where we believe we're going to have this constant Johnson & Johnson moment where, you know, there's powder in the air and we're all happy and the baby loves you and your partner loves you. And the reality is, is that when you have children, you just have more to fight about, don't you, as, as, as a couple. And so when we're seeing parents, we have to always understand that very small things for us can be very big grief. For them. And uh, I, I, I had a really difficult time with my firstborn, Noah, and he, he was quite an unwell child, and I was in and out of my own hospital all the time. But when I thought about this, realistically, the first grief that I had as a parent was realising I was still going to be in maternity clothes for about four months. It's like, oh my God, I've still got this big fat belly. Um, and uh, as a man, you'll have never had this experience, but you know we're sold this picture that you're going to have this baby and it's all going to be joyous. But for us as women, you get out of the shower and you're literally leaking from everywhere. And you have to put on these size 20 beige pants with this massive pad in it, and you don't feel good about yourself. And, and in some ways, as soon as you deliver, that grief, it's just a continual grief and stress. Because nobody wants their children to be different. You want to do everything you humanly can to protect that child. And so when someone comes to see us, whatever you do for a living, they have had to leave the comfort of their house. They have had to organise, pack a nappy bag or pack up children who are unwell. They have come to us because on one level or another, they're desperate. And it might just be a flu to us. It might just be a sore ear, but what that person has had to do to get in front of us may be quite extraordinary. So grief comes in all shapes and sizes. And parental love knows no boundaries. And for any of you who have ever been an exhausted parent, this is what it feels like, isn't it? You know, when the whole household has got vomiting and you included, you still drag your bum out of bed and you're comforting that child, and you're putting on a load of, the, you know, the sixth load of washing for the night as someone else has spewed in their bed. And you're like, couldn't you have just made it to the toilet, darling? <laughs> but, you know, no boundaries for your love for your children. And so your desire to protect them, your desire to keep them safe is enormous. And whether it's meningococcal, whether it's, you know, autism or something really serious, as a parent, you can often feel that you have failed to protect. And it doesn't matter that cognitively for lots of these parents, they know that's not true. That's exactly how they feel. So what does grief look like? 
Well, what does a normal human being look like? Is it a blonde? Is it someone with black hair? What, what is a normal sense of humour? What is a normal favourite food? Can you answer any of those questions? No, because we are so individual. And often, people have no idea that you don't just have to cry to be sad. In actual fact, there's some real gender reasons why we won't often see men cry, and that is, I think, changing over time in, a, in, our, in our presence. And some of those are biological, so what we do know is with the rising of testosterone, prolactin can actually um, block the formation of tears. So men will sometimes say, I really feel like crying, I just, I can't make any tears, and usually some very well-intentioned wife will say, you're not trying hard enough. <laughs> But there can be some real physiological reasons why, why we don't see men cry, and also there's some very sociological reasons why we don't see men cry. If you put one male in a room of bereaved women, even though that man has lost their child as well, they often won't share their distress because their natural inclination will be to protect. So, what does grief look like? It could be diarrhoea. It can be overeating. It can be an inability to swallow anything without vomiting. It can be stomach ulcers, migraines. It can be an inability to go to sleep. It can be someone who just mindlessly watches TV for hours on end. So if you're, what you're looking is for a physical representation of grief, because that's what grief is, so it's the physical, the emotional representation of a loss, then you could be missing it if what you're waiting for is tears. And often what families will tell me is, on the way to the hospital, they psych themselves up to see you all. I will not cry. I will be ready to ask the questions that I need answers. I had a mum, she used to, she used to, I used to say to her, you sound like you're going into a military battle instead of going to see a paediatrician. She'd be like, I'm ready to fight. I've got the troops in order. You know, she was constantly trying to almost psych herself up for a conversation with you. I work in that system, and when you have your own sick child, that's how it feels like, so disempowering. So what does grief look like? First of all, ask yourself that. And if you can't answer the question, then you have to assume that often a number of the parents you are seeing are grieving. As a child, I was really obsessed with the Zaria Chamberlain to the point that if I'd been born now, if that all happened now, I would have seen a psychiatrist. I was so convinced that it was a dingo and that Lindy Chamberlain didn't deserve to go to jail. And I spent hours writing to prime ministers and everyone saying, there is a woman in jail that shouldn't be there. And as I've gotten older, I've, I've heard, gone and heard Lindy Chamberlain speak, and I believe that she went to jail because she didn't grieve properly. For those of you who are too young to know anything about this, go and watch the footage. She was a very harsh woman, is how she came across. A dingo took her baby, and people still don't believe that. And it was because they were a weird religion, the daughter's name was Azaria, which in Australia was extremely unusual. People said it meant devil, demon sperm, all of these terrible rumours that people just believed. But she never cried. This is her standing on the front step. She had a, and she had a terrible bloody speaking voice. But, you know, she was like, a dingo took my baby. And everyone's like, that bitch killed her baby. <laughs> I was the only one who didn't believe it. But... It must be extremely hard for our parents to get it right. You cry too much, you see the social worker. You cry too much, you have postnatal depression, regardless of how traumatic or difficult what you are going through is currently happening, you've got postnatal depression. You don't cry enough, you see the social worker, in denial. <laughs> how do these parents get it right? What is the right amount of grief when your child's been diagnosed with leukaemia? What's the right amount of grief when you're told that your child will never be able to feed? These are impossible questions. 
And yet, I see you all with this enormous amount of compassion and leaning in when Tara is telling her story yesterday. And we had the beautiful beaties come up and tell their story about Logan. You know, it, you're all leaning in, and yet, you need, feel, often feel the need to protect yourself, and I understand it, in the clinical environment to just say, oh, it's the kid with CF. The kid had got their leg amputated by the lawnmowers in bed four. You know, we need to distance ourselves. But if we can all take a moment before we see any parent and think, what would it be like to be them? What would it be like to be them? So it's very hard to know how to grieve properly. And everybody has a story to tell. Everybody. You know, we see so many parents now who have these children who have quite challenging, complex medical conditions, born premature, many of them, 15 cycles of IVF. Like precious children where they've made enormous sacrifices financially, physically, emotionally. That's the background of their story. Equally, if you have six children and one of them is sick, or for God forbid one of them dies, it's not like you've got five to replace them. You know, you never know what part a child has to play in a family. Someone's been doing bereavement work for 20 years. You hear this over and over again. I didn't realise that they were the clown. They were the child that kept the house light. I didn't realise that they were the child that was the peacemaker. I never realised that that one was our little helper. You know, these kids can't be replaced. They leave this terrible chasm of grief in people's lives forever. If you are already having marital problems and then someone backs over a child, if you're already having marital problems and you find out that your child has a learning difficulty, it doesn't have to be a world event to be a world event for that family and for that child. So having some understanding of people's story and context is important. There's all this hidden and disenfranchised grief. And you may not have heard the term disenfranchised grief before, but essentially it's about grief that people don't understand. And I think for lots of our parents, particularly of parents who have children that are quite disabled, you know, we're like, oh, you, I, you see people come in, it's not because they're cruel, it's just because it's like, oh, your baby's blind. Oh, your baby's deaf. Oh, your baby's going to have seizures. Oh, your baby. So when they come in and say to these parents, yeah, you're not going to be able to keep breastfeeding. We're going to put a nasal gastric tube down. You can't understand the magnitude of grief about those smaller things in comparison. You know, I often think not being able to feed your child is such a hidden grief in our hospital system. And we do it so blasé. We're just going to pop a nasal gastric tube down. It's not putting on enough weight. Feeding is one of the most celebrated, important parts of our community. You know, we eat when we're happy, we eat when we're sad, we eat to celebrate, we eat to gather, we eat to connect. We're eating too much as a society, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> On the whole, eating is very important. So you have a child that will never eat. It is often the last terrible blow to a family who had hope about one thing, just one thing. So there's a lot of disenfranchised grief that happens because, you know, in our storytelling, one of our beautiful parents and colleagues here said, you know, um, I know that there's far worse things, but there's not far worse things when it's your child. My son has anaphylaxis to dairy, egg and nuts. And I can often rationalise it like, he's got a great brain and he's a good looking boy and he's popular and he's this and that, but he will never travel overseas without huge risk. He can't get on a plane without huge risk. School camp terrifies me. I always struggle at Easter. He's 17. It's disenfranchised that he is never going to taste ice cream. He's never going to taste chocolate. He'll never know what a toasted cheese sandwich is like. 
you know, they're small things, but they're, it's a grief for me. And he has to, you know, he's graduated from pediatrics to adult health. And the morning that he was going there, he was such an asshole to me, to be honest. <laughs> and I was, we had a bit of a fight and I went into my room and thought, he knows today they're going to say, that's it, it's for life. And he's just, you know, he's great about it. He doesn't complain. It's disenfranchised grief. It's still grief. It makes him extremely different from his peers and means he has to regulate his risk all the time. So be very careful of those hidden grief that we can just blow them over. What would your life be like if you could never eat? What would your life be like to look at a book and not be able to see letters sequentially? And we, ah, oh, it's just a learning disorder. It's just an ordinary processing problem, allegedly. You know, all of these things that families hear over and over again. There's also a thing called intergenerational grief. And that's where people are carrying inherited grief all the way through. This is a really interesting, I think we'll learn more about the science of this as time goes by, but there has been some research done that shows that in cultures where there's been enormous starvation, the next generation is more likely to store fat. So amongst our um, survivors of Jewish concentration camps, also from Vietnam, places where people were starved, the next generation almost has a DNA imprint, is what they believe, around storage of fat. If your body can attune to that, what does it mean for you if your family has been tortured and, you know, persecuted for years and years on end? And our indigenous cultures around the world are carrying this grief. You know, we had all of those lovely, we've had a lovely diverse culture all the way through this con um, conference. But when you hear Indigenous people speak, a lot of people who come to us, in Queensland in particular, they come, they've never been on a plane. Some of them have never seen proper sewerage. And they come into our hospital and their only previous experience of big systems full of white people is to have their children removed. And we say, trust us. We're speaking in a language you don't understand. We dress differently to you. We're smarter than you. Trust us. They are carrying grief that we cannot understand. We can have a level of empathy. We can try to learn about it, but we do not know what that is. And now we also have so many people coming through our hospital who have survived terrible torture terrible torture in war-torn countries and they have risked life and limb to get to us, then we park them somewhere until they can prove they're real refugees and then they get here and despite all that, their children still have accidents. Their children still get diagnosed with things. What resources do these people have? You know, like, we have to rely on translators who often we know aren't telling, saying exactly what we're saying. What is their level of understanding? So intergenerational grief is very important. The other thing I wanted to talk to you about is a thing called chronic sorrow. And that is what happens when people have this long-term pervasive grief that has no end point. So that can be the case. If you, any of you have parents at the moment with dementia, or Parkinson's, or someone that you love, the person that you knew is no longer there, but the shell of them is. If that person had died, people would have bought food and sent flowers, but you have a diagnosis and you just have to keep going. What is also interesting about chronic sorrow is that for parents who have children with disability, or for parents who have children with syndromes, is that it's almost like their brains have to be like a filing cabinet. I know this is going to kill them prematurely. I know that they're never going to be toilet trained. I know that society is never going to see my child the same as they might even see the child with cancer. I know, but they have to try and push all of that to the back. And at the front, they have to try and live with a level of hope. And for people with chronic sorrow, they don't get the chance to grieve. 
Because from the second that baby has a hypoxic injury at birth, they have to be listening, learning all the time while they're trying to no negotiate a system. It's quite busy for them. They're trying to educate themselves so that they can deal with our garbage, the way that we do things. So they never just get to grieve. And the problem with chronic sorrow is that it keeps changing. So, you know, we come to people and we say, this is going to be very difficult for you to do long term. This baby is going to be so disabled. You know, why are these parents pushing on for God's sake? This kid's going to have no quality of life. But the reality is, is that their brains are saying it can't be that bad. It can't be worse than death. No, you know, death is so final. It's, you know, I was given this child for a reason. I have to push on because I can think of nothing worse, nothing worse. And so they have to keep trying to negotiate the system. And do you know, it's very easy to believe when you've got an eight week old that you're going to be able to do whatever needs to be done. When that baby is 80 kilos and six foot four and still in nappies and requires lifting and carrying and bathing, that's a very, but they can't project themselves to the future. So that's what chronic sorrow is. And the problem with chronic sorrow is everyone in the household can be impacted by chronic sorrow, but in different phrases at different times. So just when dad finally gets hopeful, Mum's in misery and he's like, God, you've been saying to be optimistic. Now I'm being optimistic and you're all sad. You know, the, the, it's so difficult for people to live with that pain day in and day out. Parental bereavement is believed to be the most painful, most sorrowful thing that can happen in a person's life. About every four days, I am exposed to a child dying in some way, shape, or form. And I've been doing work with parents who've lost children over a very long time. And it is the loneliest experience a person can go through because nobody understands how long it hurts, how long it makes you not understand the world how long you feel like an utter, utter failure that you couldn't keep your child alive. And people have children die from a whole range of reasons. But I can guarantee you it doesn't matter if your child dies after a prolonged illness for 11 years or your child drowns in the pool. There is no good way to have your child die. None. And people say to me, how long does it take to recover? I don't know. And how long does it take till the grief goes away? We don't know. There was a lovely study done about a decade ago where they asked bereaved parents to draw a circle on a piece of page. So they were asked to draw their life in a circle and then they were asked to draw their grief. And they were asked to do that at about two months after their child died. So if the piece of paper was this big, they would draw their life like this, and they would draw their grief right around the edges of the paper. And seven years later, they went back and they said to them, draw your grief. Do you have any, who thinks it's smaller and who thinks it's bigger and who thinks it got, stayed the same? What do you think? Same. So they asked them to draw their grief and seven years down the track, it was exactly the same. But what was interesting is for most people, life had grown around it. So the grief hadn't gotten one, one tiny bit easier. It's just that life got bigger and they learned to live with it like a, a burn scar. Just always there and some days it's very painful and some days not so much. But parental bereavement is the ultimate life sentence. The ultimate life sentence. How long does grief last for? I don't know if any of you saw this, but just recently, a baby orca whale was born dead, was stillborn. And the mother whale was seen for 17 days pushing the calf up with its nose trying to make the baby breathe. 
17 days. If a mammal such as a whale can feel such profound grief following the stillbirth of her child, we can only imagine what a human being who plans and cherishes and has dreams and whole cognition of what their life is going to be like when they lose a child. The other thing I want to say to you is guilt is such an enormous weight on these parents' shoulders. An enormous weight. And every single one of you has the ability to change the story in these parents' heads when they ask you, could this be because I drank too much coffee? Don't be flippant about it. Say, absolutely not. Could this be because once, when I was like 13 weeks pregnant, I was pushing the shopping trolley and I hit a pothole and it came back. Could that have done it? Absolutely not. And more than that, what I'm going to promise you is this just happened. You didn't do one single solitary thing wrong. And I don't care if they don't ask you, say it anyway. And so when parents who have had a child drown or they back over their child or they accidentally shoot their child or whatever the case may be, when they ask you, tell them this is why it's called an accident. This is why it's called an accident. You know, it's always the children who are adventurous who get into the most mischief. Reframe it for them. Put them on a journey where their grief can be something they can live with. So please absolve the, every family that you see of their non-existent sin. Because I can promise you, it doesn't matter how many times as a social worker I say, you didn't do anything wrong. If one doctor says, this was not your fault, that's what sticks with them. You have a power far beyond the rest of us. Please use that power wisely. Because every single parent that you see, regardless of their language, the amount of tattoos they have, the way, that, you know, whatever, every parent in the core of themselves wants to be a good parent. And you can put them on a track that says, you were the perfect parent for this perfect child. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. I suspect we have questions. Um, I know we've got a couple on Twitter. Is there anyone else who wants to ask for the audience so just so I can plan timings? I went way over there. Okay, Grace, why don't you far away? Yep, so um, I think that was an amazing talk, Liz, and something that I think all of us have dealt with on a regular basis at work, but probably it's a difficult thing to hold and it's a difficult thing to look at because it's uncomfortable. Uh, one of the people on Twitter sort of pointed out that sometimes we laugh because we're trying to distance ourselves because it's, it's very vulnerable to be talking about this. So thank you for raising it. Um, Mary Smith asked... Can I, can I just comment oh, yeah. on that? So obviously I don't carry this pain around with me all the time and anyone who knows me knows I have a terribly sick sense of humour and I... <laughs> friggin' laugh about everything. So I'm not saying hold this grief. I'm saying hold them in the moment and then do what you need to do. Like, and actually compassion is quite a protective factor for self-care. Not empathy, compassion. It's a completely different thing. You don't have to imagine how every single person feels and then go home at night and ruminate and ruminate over it. In that moment, in that several minutes, Make sure you just give them the best that you can and then go on your merry way. You don't have to hold that forever. So I'm sorry if that was, the that was not meant to be the message. That answers two of the questions, but you might want to comment on it. Um, uh, Mary Smith says, would parents want to see our grief more often? I'm sure they'd be surprised that many a registrar or consultant has had to psych themselves up to notify parents of a diagnosis or intervention that also breaks our heart. And the second one that I think you also touched on is from Naomi Kilov, who said, 
how do you wear your heart on your sleeve and avoid compassion fatigue? Yeah, look, can, can I just say, I think you should expect to have compassion fatigue. <laughs> you know, but seriously, in your career, if you never feel compassion fatigue, something has gone a little bit skew with. So it doesn't mean, though, that it's going to disable you. You know, there are times when I've done too many traumas, too many deaths, where I'll just say to the other social workers, I'm taking the bronchiolitis for a, little, for a few days, or I just get my head together. Because we're on clinically every day. We don't actually rotate in and out where, who's on. We're on clinically every day. So, um, and I absolutely have days where I've got compassion fatigue, and there's times when I've stepped out to do project work and, and things like that. So I think you need to expect it. But you also have to have a plan of self-care happening all the time in the background. And alcohol, I'm afraid, is not a sole tool for self-care, all right? You need to be a little bit more imaginative than that. The other thing is, is that um, parents are very touched, actually, when, when they see people cry. You know, they'll often make comment, and the nurse cried, and that meant a lot to us, or the doctor cried, because we knew that we weren't just another number. If a parent ever has to console you, you have gone too bloody fast. <laughs> so a couple of tears is fine, but this is not your grief. This is not your moment. Um, and there are, you know, there are times where I have definitely had a sob. That's for the car or the shower or the tea room. That is not in front of it. But to have some tears, to show people that you're dreadfully sad for them is actually very empowering. And, a, and it's a meaningful con you know, communication and connection for the two of you. Get um, off. Sorry, it's Russ's turn. <laughs> Fantastic. I think um, Ben Simon said something we've been thinking about, so it's a last comment. Um, I always thought Liz Crow was the heart of paediatric critical care, but I'm currently learning she's also our conscience. Aww. Thank you. Thank you.